there, unless the wife sees the husband going up, she doesn't know. So the husband says, you know, where's wife? Well, sorry, I don't know, somewhere over there. <laughs> Do you know, very often it's people who've never been out before. He will take that man to the edge of the veranda, and even though there are 5,000 people there, he will point to exactly where the wife is in that crowd. Oh, I've seen that happen several times. And then, of course, the husband walks slowly over, the wife sees, and he calls her. You know, it's beyond, I say beyond belief, it's, a, it's true, but I mean, it is fascinating to see it. But he knows everything, and of course, obviously, I say, inevitably, over the years, I've been blessed with, well, I think we've been out nine times, we've had lots of interviews, and when I say talk about miracles, it's a question really of what you haven't seen, because I've seen so many extraordinary things happen. And some of the simplest amuse me, interest me, oh, I say amuse me, and things I'll never forget. In the early days, um, you probably know, they had electricity cuts almost every morning. And when the electricity went off, it went off for three or four hours at least. Yeah. Now, one time we went in the interview room, Swami always, first of all, goes puts the switches on the fan. That's one of these big punkers, they call them, noisy. And so you know, noisy means to say that, as I do, he talks very quietly, of course, sometimes it's difficult to hear what he's saying. So when we had a power cut, while we'd only been in there about 10 minutes, and the fan stopped, I thought, thank God, because now I'm going to hear him, hear him more. more you used thought, thank God, did you? I said, That was dangerous. <laughs> because you know what happened. No. <laughs> this is what God did. He just picked, put his hand up like that, pointed at the thing, and said, go, go. And what do you think happened? It went immediately. <laughs> Same old noise. But, you know, when you think about it, it takes a bit of explaining. Yes. And that's one thing I'll never forget as long as I live. Apps and everybody sort of roared with laughter. I don't know whether we clapped. <laughs> that's what we felt like. But, um, you know, I have no point in talking about all the rings he's produced. I mean, I've seen everything, necklaces, all these things, changing one ring from one shape to another, one type of ring to another, producing watches. And another thing that makes us laugh, beautiful watches. Um, having produced it, he'll look at the time, then he looks at the clock on the side there, he said, oh yes, right time. I remember once it was 10 to 8 in the morning <laughs> and gave it to the lady. But I suppose one of the miracles we saw there in that interview room, one of our, well it must be what now, six, seven years ago I suppose, is when he produces what they call ladu. You know ladu, the Indian sweet meat? Yes, uh, which is I've heard of it. But I yes, it's rather like hot fudge, uh, except fudge is more solid, this is semi-solid. So we were in the interview room, there were 20, 25 people in there, and Swami, you know, produced all of the booty, which he always does. Then he called up a little Indian girl, told her to cup her hands like that, and then he simply held his hand, like that, over her hands, and from his hand just poured down this ladu. It's light colored stuff, enough to completely fill her hands. And not to fill her hands, it started dropping over, you know, he didn't quite switch off. <laughs> so started dropping off onto the floor. We people who were all around, we were picking it up off the floor because it was absolutely delicious. Needless to say, afterwards it was handed around, it was enough for 25 people. And that ladu was still warm, as though it had come, you know, just out of the oven. Not hot, but warm, just as you would love to have it. Yes. Well, that was very impressive. I mean, I've never had any doubts about the miracles that they are genuine. I mean, there's not an element of any, no doubt of any sort to me. But, you know, people say, oh, up his sleeve, down his sleeve from here. But I mean, when you see this going on, 
just coming out like this, dropping down into her hands, I mean, it couldn't be more clear. It was other times before he does some of the miracles, because he knows that people there don't, you know, suspect. He, you'll see him pull the sleeves right up. I've heard of this. You yes. know, this happens. But I mean, I've seen so many things. Um, but as I say, another interesting thing, a story which I'll never forget, this was a white field. Um, we had a great friend in uh, Canada, Dr. Singh. He ran, ran the Canadian organization. And he was out there. Jean and I were staying in a hotel in Bangalore. We went out every day for Darshan by taxi. Uh, Dr. Singh, he was living out of Whitefield, or, you know, he, not in Bangalore. And one day, he said, uh, would I give him a lift back into Bangalore because he had some business to do and then bring him back in the afternoon. And so I did that. On the way back, because he's interested in business, and our, the story of our firm, the family firm, which goes back to the 1820s, is quite interesting. <clears throat> and he was very interested. So as we drove out in the afternoon, and Jean didn't come in the afternoon, he wanted me to tell him the whole story about the, the old Raleigh brothers, which instantly had branches all over India in the old days. And he was really interested. So I told him some very interesting stories, things that had happened. But I talked non-stop, and I was exhausted by the time we got to Whitefield, but he insisted on, he was so interested in the story. We get out there, and okay, in the evening, at this time, the, I don't think Swami came out to give Darshan, he only came in front of the house, the house before it's been rebuilt now, but he'd come out of the house, all the students were in line, well, sitting on the floor in front of the house, and we so-called, I hate using the word VIP, central coordinators, you know, all we people, probably 50, 60 of us, were behind the students where the little wood, you know, there are a few trees and things there. And we just stood there, and needless to say, from the moment we arrived, we, the moment we went through the gate, all the conversation stopped. I never said a single word to anybody. And so I was standing there. Swami came out of the house, and I mean, he talked to different students. Then there was one student, Swami was there, Stu, that particular student was between Swami and me and it was all in Telugu, but Swami was clearly giving him a rocket, as we say, telling him off for what? I have no idea. And he looked quite serious, Swami, you know, he can put on any face. And having told this chap off, he then lifted his finger up at me, pointed directly at me, and there's nobody all that close to me, and he said, and you too, too much talking. <laughs> I thought, that's very unfair. <laughs> I thought, because funnily enough, these so-called VIPs, you know, some of the uh, people who have there, been there for years, I mean, even though you're not meant to talk, they, they chat away. Yeah. I, of course, being a relative newcomer, I kept totally silent. So I thought to pick me out and say, too much talking. But I can tell you, the penny dropped very quickly. Swami was aware of the whole of the episode of what had happened in that taxi driving out to Whitefield, where I had talked non-stop for half an hour and probably a bit of an ego trip with it, you know, all the amazing things that had happened we had done and so on. And so when Swami said, you too, too much talking, that's what it was about. And I knew then for certain, not that I ever had any doubts about Swami, that he, well, he's omnipresent, and he was there and aware of every single thing that had happened. And the same with everybody else. The same with everybody else. He does know everything. And then, of course, you have the jokes. I mean, people arrive out there, even people who are presidents of a country or whatever it may be, and sometimes, you know, when they arrive day one, uh, oh, you know, where, where are you from? <laughs> where are you from? But it's all part of the game. And you find out, of course, uh, as time goes on, that not only he knows everything about you, 
I think he personally he knows all about your previous lives, he knows about all your children, he knows absolutely everything about everything.